How's it going, everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to the channel. And holy moly, am I just gonna say now that this video was the longest challenge I've done that's an, a non-Professor Oaks challenge. I literally took the entire week on this video just to get it out on time, and sure enough, it's the Pokemon Black and White No Damage Challenge. So, I'm sure you guys have seen the three prominent No Damage Challenge videos here on YouTube. Links will be in the description. And if you haven't, go watch those after this video, since they're very interesting. I'll be going with Small Ant's rule set that he used in Pokemon Platinum, meaning I'll be saving after every gym and resetting if I take any damage, with one exception that we'll get to in just a moment. Also, I won't be using items in battle, though Pokeballs and held items are alright. And lastly, no use of the daycare. This would make the challenge too easy since the daycare is on Route 3, straight after the first gym, and it would make life way too easy. That'll be challenging after all. Before we get into the explanations for everything though, I just want to implore you guys to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I've been looking at my analytics as of late, and only 83% of you guys are unsubscribed. I said only, I don't know why I said only, but yes, 83% of you guys are unsubscribed, and I have the goal of hitting 60,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So, if you could help me reach my goal, that would be very much appreciated. Either way, I named myself Chaotic and started off with probably the most threatening part of the run. Pokemon Black and White are very different with the fact that you have to face off against both of your rivals after selecting your starter, no opportunity to train up your Pokemon beforehand, and no way to save in between. Of course, this means rather than one RNG-filled battle of hoping it uses status moves, it's two battles. Also, I must add that Tackle has been upgraded in Generation 5, from a 35 power, 95% accurate move, to a 50 power, 100 accurate move, meaning we have to get our opponents to use its status move 100% of the time or else we are screwed. This is very, very impractical, since it's usually a 4 or 5 shot to take down each rival, meaning you have to hit that 50% chance of them using said move 8 to 10 times in a row to progress. Fortunately, none of these Pokemon have access to attack lowering or defense increasing moves, so we at least have the option of all three Pokemon. I instantly ruled out Tepig since despite the fact that it has superior attack compared to the other two, it's much slower and definitely going to give us problems after these battles during the early grinding attempts. Oshawott was my first choice actually, since it has access to Aqua Jet, a great move for priority since we'll be able to use that to bypass other Pokemon using things like Quick Attack, which also starts happening after the first gym. But this also was a struggle due to having relatively pitiful physical attack at this point in the game. So I decided to meet in the middle and chose Snivy, my favorite starter. This Pokemon is faster than both Oshawott and Tepig, has great physical attack with moves like Leaf Blade later on, and has a very superior speed stat. I'll stop now, I won't make any more puns, I promise. This was the initial strategy though, since of course, these battles are RNG insanity when playing by these rules, and it's why I decided to spend a bit over 12 hours just resetting over and over again on this battle to get it to work. But after that, bam and bam, down for the count with no damage, perfect. This is the only point aside from gym leaders that I'm saving, and that's because damn it, I'm not doing these battles again. <laughs> And if you're looking at the time on the bottom screen, eh, it looks pretty similar to the beginning of these attempts, right? Yeah, that's because that was the next day. Again, challenge is long. <laughs> but let's get into the few threats we have ahead of us before the first gym. So, we don't have any access to Audino training yet, meaning it's going to be very difficult for us to train effectively and get to a high enough level where we outspeed and one-shot both of Chili's Pokemon. So, I decided to start on Route 1, going after a bunch of level 2s, until I was able to one-shot them with Vine Whip with Snivy, managing to get decently lucky and get them to use status moves if I ended up missing the one-shot. This took a few attempts, but not enough attempts to be worth pulling my hair out over. Training other Pokemon right now is really a no-go at this point, since I can't switch train without it literally being a run killer and everything's too low of a level. However, there is a gift Pokemon that I can get in the Dream Yard, and that's Panpour. It's level 10 starting out, meaning it's plenty high enough of a level to one-shot stuff on the first route with Water Gun. I did some damage calculations, and I saw that I needed to be around level 25 to ensure a one-shot on Jilly's Pokemon. So I trained Snivy up and evolved it into Servine, and trained Panpour up to around that level and got Skull to take on Jilly. 
Also, I somehow got Pokeruss again. This is like the second time I've gotten it in a challenge outside of the Heart Gold Soul Silver Professor Oak challenge, but I don't think I've ever gotten it so early on in a Pokemon game. Anyway, getting to Chili himself, sure enough, his Lillipup is a one-shot with Sir Vitan's Vine Whip, and Panseer goes down to a single Scald from Panpour, getting me the Trio Badge. Perfect, one down, seven to go. But if you thought that was hard, we are nowhere near done. Team Plasma in the Dream Yard doesn't really give me any problems, but there is a required double battle on round three. Luckily, it's not a team battle, so I'm able to take them down with Servine and Panpour, both outspeeding, but Charon wants to fight right afterwards. He leads with Tepig at level 14, so Tackle was on a one-shot with Servine. Uh, I made a mistake, and it was about to cost me, but he decided to use Defense Curl since it worked so well in our last battle, allowing me to survive another day. Of course, his Purloin doesn't have any priority moves yet, so it's outsped and taken out with Vine Whip. But he's not who I should be worried about. It's Team Plasma in the Wellspring Cave. There is a team battle here, and they are scary, because Charon can be an idiot and not knock out the other Pokémon, it can be a little bit of a pain. So I decided that I needed to train something that I had had a multi-targeting move. That, of course, ended up being Pidove, since it also has access to Quick Attack, something that I will need for later on as well. So I went back to Route 1 after catching it, training it on weak Pokémon until I was sure it can one-shot Audinos on the route, slowly working my way back to Route 3 and evolving it into Tranquil and getting it to level 23 before taking on Team Plasma. The first battle is a single battle, so I use Quick Attack to take him down, but the second set was the team battle with Charon, and oh yeah, I misclicked with Quick Attack. And guess what, Luck strikes again and the other patch out on the field uses Bite on Tepig, letting this man right here fight another day. Well, hopefully I can stop making these sorts of mistakes since I guarantee you it ends up finishing off one of these attempts somehow. And it's going to end up being one where I level up like 20 levels and I have to do it again and it's going to really tick me off. Anyway, the next threat in this challenge is Lenora. She has only two Pokemon, a Herdier and a Watchog. So I decided that I needed to grind Servine to level 32 to get Leaf Blade and to level 36 to evolve into Superior. Now I can outspeed both and land a 90 power, 100% accurate move on both Pokemon to win the battle. And there we go, basic badge. Two down, six to go. With that out of the way though, I actually didn't really worry about this section all too much, as I had already had a high enough level to clear out Team Plasma from the Pinwheel Forest, and enough to get the EXP share from the Battle Company in Gastalia City. However, I know that Berg's got a few tough Pokemon, so I decided to grind up Tranquil to level 32 to learn Air Slash and evolve into Unpheasant, then went into the gym to clear out the trainers. I know Berg's got a Dwebble with Sturdy, so I'm going to need to train up something that has a multi-hit move, but I may as well clear them out first for convenience. And then I made the utterly dumb mistake of running into a trainer who happened to have a Dwebble, and sure enough, Sturdy made it stay alive and a hit on Pheasant. So I reset and did everything again, which took probably about another two and a half hours. However, now I decided, all right, we need to get our sturdy breaking Pokemon. There's only two Pokemon that have access to multi-hit moves so far in the game, those being Roggenrola and Drillbur. Roggenrola has the downside of being super slow. Even as a Gigalith, it has a base 25 speed, but it gets Rock Blast, a 25 power, 90% accurate stab rock type move, whereas Excadrill has great speed, but Fury Swipes is a 85 accurate, 15 power move. I sort of wish I could get a Minchino by this point, since it can get three of these moves, those being Tail Slap, Bullet Seed, and Rock Blast for different scenarios, but I can't get one until Route 5, so it seemed like a relatively easy decision for me. Grab a Rog and Rolla, which I decided to use the XP share to level up while also training Tranquil to evolve again. After getting it to evolve into Bulldor and leveling it to level 31, I challenged Bird. Whirlipede was a one-shot from Unpheasant, Dwebble was a one-shot with Bulldor's Rock Blast, though I gave it the Quick Claw just in case it didn't outspeed, since I'm not sure if IVs and EVs are applied to opposing trainers. It's weird, I don't know, I'd have to do more research. but. It popped anyway, so it didn't matter. Letting on Pheasant take out his Levani with a single Air Slash and winning me the Insect Badge. Three down, but unfortunately the next one is probably going to be our biggest hurdle so far. So there's not much between here and Nimbasa City, 
Bianca is in the Route 4 gate and is easily taken care of with Unpheasant, but Charon is right past her on Route 4 proper, where it's sandstorming. I was an idiot and forgot he was here, so I just reset after Unpheasant took sandstorm damage, then realized I needed to use Gigalith for the battle. However, his pit of has quick attack, and his lie part naturally outspeeds, so I had to train it up to around level 40 and hope to god that either my quick law pops or Pidove doesn't use quick attack. Fortunately, this does happen as Pidove doesn't go for quick attack and the quick claw pops on lie part, though I'm pretty sure I would have outsped at this level anyway, so it really didn't matter. The rest of the trainers are skippable throughout Route 4, letting me into Nimbasa City, and yeah, wasn't too bad, right? Wrong. After taking out the Team Plasma Grunts and getting the bike, I did some calculations to figure out what I needed to do to take out Elisa's team. She has two Emolgas and a Zebstrika, all of which have Quick Attack, so I'll need to use Unpheasant. Both Emolgas have Static as well, so I'll have to get a Cherry Berry and hope only one of them activates during the battle. So let's take a look at what level I'll need to be to one-shot. And it's level 52. Seriously. I figured I wouldn't need to be at such a high level by this point, but hey, I can't say that I'm super surprised, because Quick Attack is only a 40 power move. I did a few hours of training, as well as grabbing a Cottony from the Pinwheel Forest, th so that I could perform a trade in the Crane City. Since the Petalil that's traded over has a Cherry Berry, it's its held item, giving me exactly what I need. Fortunately for me as well, neither Amolga had their Static Ability activate, making the battle a breeze, one-shotting everything with Quick Attack, and giving me yet another save point for my adventure. The gap between gyms 4 and 5 isn't very long actually, with only a rival battle on Route 5, and the Team Plasma Grunts in the Cold Storage. However, Charon has a Lyperd with Fake Out. This has a higher level of priority than Quick Attack starting here in Generation 5, having a plus 3 priority rather than the plus 1 that it had during Generations 3 and 4. See, priority started having different levels in Generation 5, ranging from minus 7 with moves like Trick Room to plus 5 with moves like Helping Hand. Stuff like Protect has a plus 4 priority though, and sure enough, if you've seen 60 Pokemon in the Unova decks, you can get the TM for Protect from Juniper. However, I've only seen 51, so I decided to go around the region for new Pokemon, running into a Misharna in the Dream Yard, grabbing the Cover Fossil from the Relic Castle and reviving it into Tortuga, fighting trainers with new Pokemon that I had missed, and getting Evolution Stones in the Wellspring Cave. This allows me to capture both Pansage and Panseer, and evolve them both, finally giving me that 60 that I need to get Protect, and to bypass Lyperd's Fake Out. With that, I'm able to cross over the Driftvale Drawbridge and land in the city itself, where now I have to go south, beat up some Team Plasma Grunts in the Cold Storage, leaving just the gym. None of the gym trainers actually able to survive one-shots from my Unpheasant, and none of them have priority as well. Clay doesn't have anything to stand up against Unpheasant either, especially now that I gave it the TM for return, one-shotting Crocorock, Excadrill, and Palpatode to win me the Quake Badge. Not bad, only an hour in between badges is the fastest I've been able to get consecutive badges in this challenge. This gives me another save point, but that's not really a good thing now that I'm looking at battles between Gym 5 and Gym 6. The first battle is against Bianca, actually, since she... she's not actually a big problem. I'm able to one-shot everything on her team. Nothing here is a pain, though I'm glad I still had Air Slash on on Pheasant, since N's Pharaoh Seed has the ability Iron Barbs, which would have hurt me if I had used any physical attack, which is basically my entire team at this point, aside from my underleveled Simipore. Once I arrived in Mistralton City, though, I was able to go up into the Celestial Tower to get Skyla into her gym. This place also has a barely any required trainers and is flyable from the top, so I just did the good old evasion of trainers, got to the top, did some damage calculations, and figured out that Skyla's Unpheasant has quick attack. So I have to make sure I can one-shot it with my own, and level 60 with a normal gem ends up being perfect. So I grinded on the Audino on Route 7 until then. And since I already got a normal gem thanks to the search for evolution stones, I'm perfectly fine. One-shotting Swoobat with Fly, Unpheasant with a boosted quick attack, and Swanna with Return, netting me the jet badge. Level 60 at badge 6, that's not too bad. About where I expected the average to be. And honestly, I'm thanking the Lord for Audino, since the EXP curving system would normally make a challenge like this absolutely atrocious. And it would be in something like Generation 7 where Audino isn't available, but here in Generation 5, it's not too bad. 
Right before Twist Mountain, Jaren decided to challenge me again, so I took him down with Return on Unpheasant, Return on Pig Knight, and whoopsie, I need to replace Return for Protect since I forgot about Fake Out. It's nice having unlimited uses of TMs, or else I'd probably have to go without Fly throughout this entire thing, since I don't want to risk grabbing an additional Pokemon and inflicting a point of damage on me because of a failed Pokeball. Either way, it's not even five minutes before- dang it, I ran into this pain in the bum trainer. It is a rotation battle, but I got past it decently thanks to Protect, preventing it from being possible for his Lipar to use Fake Out, and Charon straight after, so I wiped the floor with his team thanks to Fly on Unpheasant and Pig Knight, Protect and Fly on Lipard, and Fly on Simisage, letting me progress. Of course, Fly is a 95% accurate move, but I'm willing to put my odds on that for a battle like that to make my life a little bit easier in the long run. Twist Mountain is really easy in the winter, so I'm able to pass right through and emerge on the other side to Osiris City, where I'm able to fight the gym leader without any more obstacles, actually. I actually did a few damage calculations before running in here, and sure enough, I can already take him out since Unpheasant outspeeds all of them. So I just used Fly on Vanillish, Bear Tick, and Cryogonal, taking them out and winning me the Icicle Badge. I definitely should have swapped Protect for Return for this fight, but hey, again, 95 accuracy isn't too much to worry about. And, pff, wowie, almost 34 in-game hours. Of course, I've been using an accelerated frame rate so that the game doesn't look like trash while speeding up, so it hasn't been that long IRL, but the resets, yeah, it's been about half that, so that's a lot. So with seven badges in hand, let's take a look at the battles I'll be needing to take care of for this part of the game. There's two major ones, one with Bianca on Route 8, and the battle against Drayden for the gym badge. The first factor I had to fix was changing the season from winter so that Hale wouldn't be going during the battle against Bianca on Route 8, which isn't a big deal. But what is a big deal, unfortunately, is that Bianca's Samurott has Aqua Jet. So I did a damage calculation on that with Quick Attacks from Unpheasant, and with a normal gem, I need to be level 78 to take down Samurott in one shot. So I used Fly in her Stoutland, and then... <sighs> Gotta be kidding me, I knew I was gonna accidentally do this. Well, it's all or nothing with Return, and sure enough, she doesn't go for Gawkwa yet, allowing me to not have several wasted hours of my time grinding. My lord, this game's letting me get away with so many mistakes. Sadly though, one of those mistakes wasn't allowed. After clearing the story events and clearing out the gym of trainers, I ended up scouring the world for rare candies, as Drayden's Drudigan has rough skin, so I can't hit it with everything aside from Air Slash to KO with no damage. So after some damage calculations, I had very, very good odds of one-shotting it at level 86 with Air Slash, so I decided to go for it. And sure enough, the fact that there was even a chance of me not being able to KO finally kicked my teeth in, leading to me barely missing the range and getting hit. Well, so after another three IRL hours of grinding and rare candy hunting again, I challenged again and got the KO on his fracture with Return, Air Slash on Drudigan, and Return on Haxorus, for the final Legend Badge. Alright, final preparations time. By this point, on Pheasant's level 87, and I'm able to take down Charon pretty easily, though I wasn't surprised to see that Fly missed three attempts in a row. Yeah. So, that was kind of the point where I realized I was going to have to use the Move Deleter for this run, so that I could get rid of that and replace it with Aerial Ace, since for some reason, on Pheasant can't learn acrobatics. Just think about that, the Flying-type Pokémon, can't learn acrobatics, or wing attack, or peck. Just what kind of bird are you? Anyway, let's just take a look at the last six major battles of the game. So, Caitlyn doesn't have anything remotely threatening. No priority, no nothing. Making her an easy sweep with return. Chantal is an easy sweep with aerial ace, and an additional Rost Berry, just in case if Chandelure's flame body activates. Though, Jellicent's Cursed Body ability could be a massive problem if it activates, since that would require me to swap for Gigalith and take down Golurk with it. But that's not as bad of a thing as Chandelure burning on Pheasant, so I'll be going that way. Grimsley's an easy sweep with Return and a Fire Gem boosted Hidden Power on Bishar, since on Pheasant's Hidden Power is actually Fire-type, so there's yet another obstacle taken care of. Though, the obstacle here is I need to see 115 Pokemon before Professor Juniper will give me the TM for it, but I've only seen 107. But, if you thought those were the biggest pains, nah, Marshall is the biggest pain. 
Yeah, he's an easy sweep with Aerial Ace due to being a fighting type user, but his sock is the problem, having sturdy. So, taking a look at Gigalith, and at level 100, Gigalith barely outspeeds by about 5 points. Of course, this is assuming Sock doesn't have any IVs or EVs in speed. Again, I'm not sure how the game handles that sort of thing, so I'll just slap the Click Claw on it just in case. Though, I might be a bit m more risky here than I'm anticipating, but I'm just gonna pray and hope that it works. That just leaves N and gets us, though. N's got a Caracosta with Sturdy, but Gigalith can easily outspeed that since Caracosta is one of the slowest Pokemon ever, so Rock Blast should be fine. And the rest of his team goes down with Return, and gets as his team does the same, with the exception of Kofagrigus, and using Aerial Ace instead. This, sadly, is a range at level 100, but this thing doesn't really have anything to touch me other than with Toxic, so I'll just give Unfezzin a Pecha Berry and hope for the best. This leaves his Bisharp to be a big risk though, since I practically need a Fire Gem boost to take it down with Hidden Power, but it's likely to use Stone Edge, a 20% chance to miss. So we'll play the odds. That might be a risk, but I'm not training up another Pokemon. Alright, let's execute. First of all, it literally took around 8 IRL hours to grind both on Pheasant and Gigalith to level 100. I'm sure it would have been faster to train than daycare, but again, we do things the dumb way here at House Meatball. So, skipping over all of that, I did the move deleter stuff and made sure I had seen 115 Pokemon to get Juniper to give me the TM for hidden power. And went in. Sure enough, they fell like flies. First down was Grimsley, going down to return on Scrafty, return on Crocodile, protect and return on Lipard, and the fire gem boosted hidden power was enough to KO Bishar. One down, five to go. I went ahead and swept Caitlyn next, going for return and taking out Reuniclus, Sigilyph, Gothitelle, and Misharna, and moving on to Chantal. I replaced Protect with Aerial Ace for the fight, taking out Kofagrigus, Chandelure, luckily without a burn, Jillicent, luckily without Cursed Body, and Golurk. Alright, stress is at its highest with Marshall, since I'm not sure if Gigalith will actually outspeed Sock. So much so that I actually walked away from the game for a few minutes since I felt like I was going to have a heart attack, and then tried it. Throws a one-shot with Aerial Ace, and Socks out next, and the Quick Club pops! So honestly, I don't know if Gigalith would have outsped, but screw that. I don't care, three hit Rock Blast takes it out, leaving just me and Xiao and Conkledur to go down to an Aerial Ace each, leaving just Team Plasma to take care of. I filled my team up before going in so that the game wouldn't force Reshiram to the front of my party and screw up the entire run leading to the fight with Anne. Zekrom's a one-shot with Return, Vanillix is the same, leading to Karakasta, so I swapped for Gigalith to hit a successful three-hit Rock Blast, and the stressful parts are over, as the rest of Anne's team is just a one-shot with Return. Even his Kling Clang, which I honestly thought I was going to need hidden power for, but damage calculations kind of saved me there. Now, it's time for the final battle against Getsus. Fortunately, Kofagrigus doesn't have a chance to attack since I got the one-shot range leading to Bisharp. And I went for Hidden Power to take it out, and oh my god, oh, yes! Oh, <sighs> wowie. That would have sucked if Stone Age hit after all that preparation. But it misses, and that means so does Getz's his chances of winning, as the rest of his team go down to return, winning me the battle, and proving that you can, in fact, beat Pokemon Black and White without taking a single point of damage. Not gonna lie, I expected to have to have more than just two level 100s by the end of this challenge. But I think I came up with some really good solutions, though I admit I wish I could have just used a fire gem to eliminate the possibility of Bisharp hitting me, but that would have left me open to Kofagrigus, and lord knows that if I had done that, I would have missed the range and got screwed with Toxic. But it's all over, I don't have to worry. I did it! I feel like this challenge would have been a bit easier if I wasn't under time constraints, since I definitely would have went ahead and replaced Gigalith with Shinshino, then nothing would have really been a problem since there wasn't any other Sandstorm places other than Route 4, and I probably wouldn't made as many mistakes. But after a bit of research and execution within the span of about 5 days, I'm really proud of this run, and it's definitely one of my favorite non-Professor Oak Challenge videos that I've done on the channel. So where do we go from here? Well, I have the Igglybuff 386 challenge coming out on Sunday, but what about the main challenges? Well, you guys know Emerald Kaizo, right? Well, there's actually a Kaizo version for both Blue version and Crystal version as well. So I'll think I'll be tackling Blue Kaizo 
with only team of water types. Blue, water, kind of makes sense, should be interesting. And this time, I will make sure I win unlike my Grass Emerald Kaizo run. See you guys then. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe, as literally only 83% of you guys aren't subscribed, and I thought that was awfully high. If you really enjoyed it and want to support me making more content like this, then make sure to follow me on both Twitch and Twitter, and perhaps consider... I can speak, I swear. Consider tossing me a couple bucks in the form of either a Patreon pledge, Twitch sub, or YouTube channel membership. Everything else keeps my lights on and it keeps me from stuttering like a little Stay safe, stay healthy, have a great rest of your week everybody.